Hello, everyone. I am Libba Beecham, the director of the Cottrell Digital Studio here at the Northeast Georgia History Center. And I'm very excited about today's program and our special guest because we are going to dive into the legend of Nancy Hart. Now, if you have been in the Northeast Georgia region or just the, the South in general, you may have heard of this legendary woman of the American Revolution, but did she really exist? Who is Nancy Hart? Where did this legend come from? That's what we're going to explore today during this program. Now, I would love to uh, introduce our guest from Mercer University, history professor, Dr. Scott. And Dr. Scott, uh, if you could just give us a little overview of how did you become uh, interested in Nancy Hart? Um, how did this legend first come to uh, your mind? And uh, what got you fascinated about her? So I've uh, taught at Mercer for 31 years now. So uh, I've lived in Georgia and I'm an early American historian by trade. And much of my early work dealt with uh, the revolutionary and early national period, the founding period. And uh, I've always been interested in all my work in what historians sometimes call sort of secondary figures. So people like Washington and Lincoln, these are primary figures in American history. But I've always been interested in sort of secondary figures, folks who are known, but maybe not are known as well as some of the primary figures. So uh, Nancy Hart fits into, into what I've done uh, most of my career. Uh, to be honest, though, I was introduced to Nancy Hart in an academic way, uh, simply by asked to write an article about her uh, for a volume that was produced over a decade or so ago about uh, Georgia women. And so um, one of my colleagues at Mercer was the editor for that project, and she thought that I would be a good fit for this project. And I was very happy. Uh, I didn't know a lot about Nancy Hart at the time, but as I got into it, I was fascinated to learn not just the stories themselves, but also learn about where the stories came from and how they've been used in Georgia history and American history, really, uh, over the last century. So it's a fascinating tale. The story of the stories, to me, is as interesting as the stories themselves. That's what I found as well. And I suppose uh, for anyone who is not familiar with the story of Nancy Hart, as many legends go, uh, there's there's a few variations of the story, but at its core, could you tell us what each story has in common? What is the, the basic story of our legend of Nancy Hart? So there are a collection of stories. They're not just one single story. There are about seven stories that focus on events during the American Revolution. And they're all set in Northeast Georgia, up near present Hart County. Uh, late in the war, uh, 1781, 1782, when the war came to Georgia or came to that part of Georgia. And they all involve uh, this figure, Nancy Hart, who was uh, a later historian, described her as a, um, a honey of a patriot, but a devil of a woman. And so she is uh, described as uh, a big and forceful, sometimes masculine. Um, she will not take uh, any kind of sass from anyone. Um, she is her own person, uh, brave, uh, quick-witted, uh, quick-thinking. She really is this uh, sort of legendary uh, figure. Uh, one historian compared her to, to sort of ancient uh, Greek women uh, who sometimes fought alongside the men. And so um, that's the sort of overall picture of Nancy Hart, uh, a woman who uh, was very patriotic. And that's emphasized over and over, loved her country, uh, fought for her country in ways that she could fight, not in a formal army, but in, uh, as we get into the stories, we'll see some of the examples, uh, but was willing to fight for what she thought was, was right, hated Tories, um, the, the loyalists, um, as they were called, and um, just strong, forceful, brave, uh, intelligent, quick-witted uh, woman. So that's the, that's the picture. That's the sort of overall picture of Nancy Hart uh, in terms of the stories anyway. 
Right. So we have this uh, very formidable character and the story that the most basic version of the story that I'm familiar with is that, you know, Nancy Hart is at her home. Uh, she is protecting her home from the loyalists. And there's this image that I have even right behind me yeah. that's very well known of this moment of I'm a woman, I've got my gun, I am protecting my home from these loyalists. And it's this very like brave, courageous, patriotic uh, vision of this of this woman. Now, uh, could you tell us what is is that the story that is most well known or that got you know out there the most in the in the public mind? is that these Tories are coming to uh, this woman in Northeast Georgia's home, um, and she is the, the sole protector of this property, her land, her home. Could you sort of give us the, the narrative of that pretty sure. well-known version of it? Sure, this is easily the best known uh, of the stories. Uh, it's called the capture story, uh, where she captures some Tories in her home. And it's illustrated here. There's a painting in the early 20th century that's up, um, uh, used to be in the state capitol, then it was in the governor's mansion. It's kind of been moved around uh, in the recent past. Um, but here's the basic story of the capture story. Uh, Nancy Hart and her daughter were, and her daughter Suki, were in their cabin uh, one day, not nearly as elaborate house as this is uh, depicted here, more of a log cabin. Uh, and she was uh, uh, doing domestic work when a group of Tories uh, showed up and uh, came into her house and demanded that uh, she feed them. They were hungry, they were tired, and they wanted to be fed. Uh, at first, uh, she uh, cursed at them and said she would not uh, do anything. She hated Tories. I hope they would all uh, perish. But eventually, she struck upon the idea instead of of tricking them and attempting to capture them. So she settled them in, put them at a table, uh, gave them some drink, uh, started to prepare food, uh, we began to make nice with them. Uh, meanwhile, though, she sent her daughter, Suki, uh, out into the swamp to ostensibly to go get some water. But as the story goes, there was a conch shell that had been hidden out in the swamp uh, that could be blown uh, as a signal to anyone around that there was trouble uh, and that help was needed. So she sends Suki out to, to blow the conch shell, uh, which she apparently does. And uh, meanwhile, they're drinking and she's providing them food. Uh, and as they get more and more relaxed, they eventually decide to stack their weapons uh, against the wall uh, in the cabin. And uh, once she's uh, served them some food and there they seem at ease, uh, she begins to uh, steal away the weapons to uh, hand them to Suki, to hand them uh, out the door. And uh, after about the third weapon or so, they discover what she's doing. And so she grabs the weapon and as the picture here depicts, points the weapon at the soldiers and promises that if anybody makes a move on her, she will shoot uh, him dead. And so apparently one of the soldiers attempted to, to rush her and she shot him dead. So the story goes. Uh, and immediately grabbed another weapon. Uh, remember that in these days, all these weapons are muzzle loaded. They have one shot and one shot only. So it's important that she had multiple weapons there available to her. So she grabs the second weapon and, again, warns them, if anybody makes a move on me, I will shoot him dead. And apparently a second soldier decided, well, I'll give it a go. And she shot him dead uh, as well and grabbed the third weapon. So after she shot the second soldier, the story then takes a, a bit of a comedic turn. One of the descriptions of Nancy Hart was that she was cross-eyed. Uh, or at least partially cross-eyed. And apparently, uh, as the story goes, the soldiers at this point were uncertain at whom she was pointing the weapon. And so because they didn't know uh, which one would be shot if she shot someone again, they decided at this point to uh, not rush her. Uh, soon thereafter, her husband uh, showed up 
uh, at the cabin with support. Suki had blown the conch shell. They'd heard it. Uh, they came. Uh, but the husband uh, sort of quipped comically, uh, basically, I can see I'm not needed here. Um, and then the story takes a bit of a dark turn because um, Nancy is so incensed that these soldiers have invaded her home that she did not believe that uh, capturing them was sufficient and insisted instead that they be hanged. Uh, and indeed, that's, as, again, as the story is related, that's what occurred. The soldiers were hanged uh, outside the cabin out in the woods uh, at, at her uh, insistence. So it's a story that is packed with certainly bravery, uh, with uh, quick thinking, certainly with the sort of uh, loyalty to her new country, uh, it has a bit of a comedic element, but it also has this sort of darker element to it at the end there. But that is by far the most famous of the Nancy Hart stories. Yes. And I mean, it's very sensational. Uh, I would imagine that this would be a very entertaining story to tell, to read about. <laughs> and it seems to have quite a, like you were saying, quite a few different themes going on. I mean, and some surprising twists and turns. I mean, first of all, we have this the woman as our protagonist who is protecting her home sort of in this this more masculine, more man's role. And she's been depicted more masculine, uh, not very feminine. Uh, and I'm, I'm wondering why that is the case. I mean, what did this kind of story mean to readers at the time? What was its uh, agenda? If you, if, if we can kind of piece together an agenda, what would this have meant to people of the time um, when the story was uh, popularized? And, and perhaps you could tell us when was the story popularized? So this is where the story of the stories gets quite interesting. There is no current re a written record of the stories until 1848, wow. almost 75 years after the story uh, and the other stories would have taken place. There are later references, uh, two later historians claim to have uh, read about these stories in the 1820s, but th that source material does not seem to exist. So the best thinking is that these stories circulated uh, at least for about 50 years or so, 40 or 50 years, simply as uh, oral tradition. And uh, they would have been powerful. So we're dealing sort of 1782 to about 1840. And in Georgia, that's a time period that's known as the, as the frontier period. So Georgia, at the end of the revolution, existed mostly of just a strip along the Augusta along the Savannah River uh, and along the coast. But over the next 30 years from the 1780s into the 1820s, Euro Georgians began moving west. Now this of course prompted the uh, removal of the Native Americans uh, ending tragically of course in the Trail of Tears and the displacement to Oklahoma. But for the Euro-Americans, this was the frontier period, a time when self-reliance, uh, values like self-reliance, uh, strength, both male and female strength, uh, the need to protect your own home. There's no police force. There's no army around. And so these kind of values during frontier Georgia, uh, I think would have been well liked. They would have been understood to be important values in that kind of rough and tumble frontier setting. Uh, gender roles are not, not as clearly defined as they would be once uh, you get sort of more civilized uh, areas. Uh, and again, everybody had to be strong in a frontier setting. So during the oral phase, that's probably what really appealed to the circulation of the story. Oh, that totally makes sense. Uh, like you said, when you're out in the frontier, everybody has to do their part. Everybody has to be strong and <laughs> courageous against the, the wilderness and the threats. And of course, with 
the, the story going from an oral history tradition and then being written down, I'm curious, who was the first to actually write these stories down? Am I correct in understanding that there was a female author? Yes. So the first person to write these stories down, at least is what we have in terms of sources, was a woman named Elizabeth Ellett. Now, Elizabeth Ellett was a, a lead figure in the women's rights movement in the United States in the 1840s that um, sort of culminated with the 1848 Seneca Falls Convention that, that had a declaration about women's rights. And Ellett, as part of that movement, wrote a book about women in the American Revolution that told stories of different women's contributions to the American Revolution. And it's in that context that she picked up the Nancy Hart stories and began and, and published them. She published them in this book. And there was also a very famous magazine of the day called Godey's Ladies Magazine, uh, Godey's Ladies Journal. Uh, and so it was published uh, there as well. And so for Elizabeth Ellett, this seemed to be part of her desire to see women elevated in American society, uh, particularly in terms of, of rights. Again, we have someone fighting in the revolution that's supposed to be about individual rights. Uh, and then Elizabeth, Elizabeth Ellett in the 1840s is part of a movement that is uh, pushing forward uh, women's rights. Uh, what's known as first wave feminism uh, in American history. And so, yeah, she's she's the first one to pick pick the stories up. But soon after that, a couple of uh, Georgia based folks picked the stories up. In the 1850s, there were two two Georges, George White and George Gilmer. And they seem to be more interested in the stories as a way to elevate Georgia the state of Georgia, as a kind of valuable partner in the revolution. So this, I always tell my students when I teach Georgia history, uh, the sort of sad story is that Georgia didn't really play a crucial part in the American Revolution. Most of the action was elsewhere. And so uh, Georgians were constantly looking for ways to try to elevate uh, the state of Georgia, its history, its prominence. And um, this seems to have been in the 1850s, one of the ways that they could thought they could sort of uh, equal the playing field. Uh, look, we have, uh, we have our own revolutionary uh, heroines uh, in this case. And it was in the 1850s that the state legislature created Hart County. And so there is this... Um, there's this sort of movement in Georgia in the 1850s to institutionalize and, and memorialize Nancy Hart. So it has, in the pre-Civil War period, has a bit of a women's uh, rights uh, elevation to it, but also uh, sort of bringing Georgia to, to prominence. That's a, it's really interesting how this, this one story going back to the American Revolution, it's then used for various uh, reasons, you know, women's rights, the sort of patriotism of Georgia to say, hey, we're, we're important too, we were a part of this too. But then it, it's even uh, used past the, uh, the pre-Civil War era and into the Civil War and even the Re Reconstruction era in the South. And how, does it, how is it used in, in that era, um, the this, this story that goes all the way back to uh, the American Revolution? Sure. So there are uh, at least two instances, records of two instances during the Civil War itself in Georgia, where the term Nancy Hearts as a sort of designation of a group of women uh, who are defending their homes. Uh, two stories that, that came up. Uh, one was in, Nor was in Northeast Georgia. Uh, it's a bit of a comical, farcical story. The, the story is that a group of women who are going to kind of play a trick uh, on an old man in the area. They sort of dressed up as soldiers, uh, scared him into thinking that it was a Union army that had showed up. 
Uh, the town got all kind of wound up about it, and it it turned out to be a um, a uh, a bit of a joke, a bit of a farce. The other story uh, centers on uh, events in Lagrange, Georgia, right at the end of the war. the The story here is that a group of women did actually arm themselves. So, at the end of the war, in, in the spring of eighteen sixty five. Uh, Georgia had been invaded. Uh, uh, Sherman's March to the Sea was uh, from November to December 1864. And there were units of the Union Army pushing in from Alabama uh, in towards sort of western central Georgia, towards LaGrange area. And with most of the men of the town gone or injured or dead, uh, from the war, this group of women uh, took it upon themselves to um, arm themselves uh, so as to try to protect their uh, town. And uh, when the Union Army showed up, they uh, opened a parlay with the, with the Union commander. And eventually, as the story goes, uh, he agreed not to destroy the town if they would lay down their arms. Of course, Sherman had burnt Atlanta to the ground. And so uh, protecting their town was a, a victory. Um, there's, the curious thing about these two stories is, while there is period documentation for the first story, there's not period documentation for this second story. Um, we only know it from later tellings. But in both, especially in the second story, it fits with, the idea of defending hearth and home, defending your town, your land, your area. And that, that story was much of what the South claimed it was doing during the Civil War, that it was the party that had been invaded and that it was simply defending itself from uh, Northern uh, invaders. So a, a group, right, this, this idea of defending one's home, whether it's the, your actual house or your town or your state, all of that fit very well with the kind of Civil War ethos that the South was putting forward about what it was doing uh, in the war. So, uh, yes, the Nancy Hart stories do seem to have been picked up in the Civil War as part of, let's do what Nancy did. Let's defend our home against invaders that we don't like. Yeah. So, I mean, here's the story that embodies this more general idea of, like you said, to protect one's home, uh, to show courage uh, or bravery against the perceived enemies. So it seems like this story really has some staying power because of how often it can be used and can sort of embody uh, the time, uh, various times in history. Now, we one question we have we have yet to answer is: Did she really exist? Was there actually a Nancy Hart that it can be documented um, who may have inspired these stories? But was there a woman named Nancy Hart in Northeast Georgia at any time during during these this era of history? Yes, there was a Nancy Hart, um, and we know this best uh, because of the work of a twentieth very famous twentieth century Georgia historian. Uh, named E. Merton Coulter. In between the time of the Civil War and the middle of the 20th century, uh, the Nancy Star Hart stories faded for a while, but around the turn of the 20th century, they became very popular again. And there began to be all sorts of uh, programs. The, the DAR, the Daughters of the American Revolution, got a hold of the stories, and there was a Nancy Hart chapter of the DAR created in Milledgeville. And so they, in the, in the teens and 20s, these stories became very popular again. And finally, by the 1950s, uh, E. Merton Coulter said, okay, I'm going to find out as best I can, was there a Nancy Hart? Uh, because by this point, it was, there was some questioning as to whether Nancy Hart ever existed. There had been a historian around 1900 who had forcefully said, there never was a Nancy Hart. And Coulter wanted to, to find out. So he did an extensive uh, search of public records and other records of the time. 
And he very clearly established that uh, there was a Nancy Hart uh, who lived in the area, uh, probably moved there from North Carolina sometime uh, prior to the war, lived in Northeast Georgia, eventually um, after the war moved down to the Brunswick area, uh, and then finally uh, removed all the way to Henderson, Kentucky, which is on the Ohio River in sort of southwestern Kentucky, and even was able to discover that the DAR had located her grave uh, in Henderson, Kentucky. And so, yes, there absolutely was uh, a real person named Nancy Hart. Now, whether that Nancy Hart bore any physical or legendary resemblance is a you know sort of different question but she's she's not made up whole cloth there was a was a person and Coulter himself was quite convinced that there for the stories to have had the staying power that they did that they circulated by oral tradition for 50 or more years that there probably had to have been some level of veracity to the stories, uh, probably embellished, to be sure. But uh, Coulter was was fairly convinced that there was some level of truth uh, to some of these various stories. Well, that's fascinating, and it, it brings to mind the the threat that Nancy Hart faced. How, how did people in Northeast Georgia really have like a um, a fear that was based in some reality of? loyalists coming to their home? Uh, was this something that could have easily have happened um, or likely have happened? Or would this have been um, surprising uh, to someone in Northeast Georgia during the American Revolution? Yeah, no, one of the reasons why the stories uh, work so well is because what they describe fits exactly what was going on in Northeast Georgia. Again, in this sort of 1781-82 period, um, uh, Georgia had been uh, reoccupied uh, by the British. The British had fled Georgia uh, in 76, but in the late 70s, reoccupied Georgia. And uh, about 1781-82, they began to break out, uh, in, again, in the Augusta Northeast, along the Savannah River there, uh, a really very bloody and brutal uh, conflict between uh, local patriot forces and local Tory forces. Now, this was mostly not regulars. You didn't have armies, uh, hundreds or thousands of people marching around Northeast Georgia. Most of this were small bands of people, uh, sort of guerrilla warfare, uh, quick raids, um, trying to do really more intimidate frighten, dispirit the other side rather than win some big military victory on a battlefield. And so all of the Nancy Hart stories, the, the one we've talked about, there are others where she's defending her cabin. There's one where she's a, she and a group of people are trying to fight off a group of Tories. They're in a sort of earthen fort and she discovers a cannon and is able to fire the cannon and scare them away. Uh, there's another story where she dresses up as a man uh, and acts in a sort of a wild and insane fashion and infiltrates the Tory camp and learns intelligence. So it, it's these kinds of stories that would have fit very well. If the stories had been about her putting together a company of soldiers and joining the army, that wouldn't have tracked with what was going on. Um, but, but the war was particularly brutal and ugly in Northeast Georgia in 1781-82. So yes, the stories track very closely with the kinds of events that, that would have occurred uh, in, the, in the war in that time period. Right, so this certainly spoke directly to the people who were passing this story through oral tradition. It's spoken to people of the women's suffrage movement. It's spoken to those in the South of the Civil War um, and even in the Reconstruction era. I, I wonder, have you seen instances of Nancy Hart's story being used in more uh, modern times in the, in the present day? And, and if so, 
how has that story been uh, utilized for people uh, today? So um, the, the early 20th century, as I mentioned earlier, was a bit, there was a big uh, sort of push of Nancy Hart memorabilia. There was a Nancy Hart highway. Um, that was the period when the DAR actually bought property. Uh, there was supposed to be where the Nancy Hart cabin was, and that's a state park uh, today. You can go visit where her cabin was uh, supposed to have been. Uh, there was a Nancy Hart uh, train for a while, a racehorse named after Nancy Hart, uh, just a whole conglomeration. Um, there was a, apparently a TV show. I was not able to locate a recording of the TV show from the 1950s about Nancy Hart. The Hartwell area uh, did produce a big uh, parade in the 1950s. And there were, there are instances, there are images, um, but one woman in particular uh, sort of became the embodiment of Nancy Hart in the 60s and 70s. And there's actually a photograph of her with Joe Torrey, who was the Atlanta Braves manager uh, in the 1980s. She had gone, this is Nancy Hart day at the Atlanta Braves in the 1980s. Um, so it, it has continued to bubble up. She, there was a, um, a women's group in Atlanta in the 1990s that named her as one of Georgia's great women citizens. Uh, and so you will, yeah, occasionally it will still bubble up. I, I'll have to say I've lived in Georgia for 30 years. I don't, I, I can't say that it's a kind of constant topic, at least in middle Georgia. Uh, maybe it is more in Northeast Georgia. You could probably tell me uh, more about whether, uh, to what extent it bubbles up in Northeast Georgia. So yes, it, it continued to have legs all through the 20th uh, century and in all sorts of imaginative kinds of ways. Yes. And I, I've, I know that um, it, we do get asked about Nancy Hart, which is one of the reasons that we wanted to do this program to shed some more light on what we can know and what the legends are. And for those who are interested in learning even more, of course, I would certainly recommend uh, Dr. Scott's article, which if you have a JSTOR account, which is free, then uh, you can certainly read that and the link in the description will be available. But uh, Dr. Scott, are there any other resources or perhaps anything else that you, you wish that people knew about this legend or um, that, that you, that you want to share with us today before we conclude? Sure. So, uh, you know, the, the best, my, my article is more about the stories and the provenance of the stories. Uh, the E. Merton Coulter article that I mentioned earlier, it also should be available uh, on JSTORS, uh, published by the Georgia Historical Quarterly. So you should be able to find that article uh, as well. And um, uh, that that's the sort of best about the person of Nancy Hart, less so than the, the stories of Nancy Hart. I, you know, I think the thing, I'll go back to sort of where I began. To me, the story of the stories is as interesting as the stories themselves. Because what you really see is how, how humans and historians use stories to relay and support messages, different messages that they want to, to support. Humans love to tell stories. Uh, we tell all kinds of stories um, about what we had for lunch yesterday or where we went on vacation or I mean, you have social media now where people post Instagram and Facebook, and they're just telling a story about their lives. And so stories are very powerful message bearers, not just the narrative of the story, what happened, but the, the meaning behind the story and how sometimes the same story can be used for a lot of different purposes. We talked about how it was used in the 1840s to, to push forward uh, women's rights. In the 1850s, it was used to sort of bolster Georgia's reputation. Around the turn of the 20th century, as I mentioned, the DAR picked it up. And this was a period uh, of sometimes ugly American patriotism. So there was a phrase from the time period, 
100% American and was used as a kind of anti-immigrant slogan. And Nancy Hart was, her stories uh, were used for that purpose uh, as well. That this is a sort of true American. So the stories can, you know, stories can be used for good or they can be used for ill. None of this, of course, is Nancy Hart's fault. Uh, she had, uh, she didn't do anything about the writing of the stories as, as far as we know. But yeah, I think it's, a, it, it, uh, her tale uh, is a testimony to the power of stories and how they have, they have historical value, but they also have civic value, they have personal value. These are inspiring stories uh, to the extent that they are true. They, they can be quite inspiring. Well, Dr. Scott, thank you so much uh, for joining us and sharing all of this about Nancy Hart. And to our members, I encourage you to read Dr. Scott's article. The link will be in the description. And I'll also include a link um, to the, uh, you said that was authored by- uh, E. Merton Coulter. E. Merton Coulter. So that I'll put that in the link description as well. And we encourage you to uh, dive in and learn even more uh, because like Dr. Scott said, this is a story that carries a message and who knows how it will be used in the future. And by knowing even more about the story's history, you can uh, be a bit more connected to how it's going to be used in the future. And even uh, right now, who, who knows who's using Nancy Hart as a, a, a symbol of their, their own agenda. We'll see. Well, Dr. Scott, thank you so much uh, for joining us today. We really appreciate the time. Thank you, Leva. A uh, real pleasure to be with you.